Hello, everybody. Yeah. Good afternoon. Hello. All right. Don't be so quiet, huh? <laughs> Gosh. Well, we so, haven't seen you so long. Right. <laughs> so um, today we're going to basically break this down into two parts. Uh, number one, I'm going to go through the objections that I kind of have written out, you know, that we receive on a regular basis and, of course, how we handle them. And then uh, we'll spend the last 15, 20 minutes or so covering whatever objections you have or things that you've heard um, that, you know, are kind of stumping you a little bit. We jokingly call it stump the chump, uh, but really it is uh, the things that you're hearing most in the market today that are throwing you off or, you know, hey, somebody said this and, and it cost me, you know, the listing, I couldn't handle it properly, whatever it is. Now, I would ask um, if it's a unique situation, like that doesn't come up very regularly, then obviously probably ask me about that one-on-one -on -one, because we want everyone to learn from it. You know, that, that one time a seller said one thing that you couldn't overcome, right? But if it's something that's pretty regular, those are the things that I want to hear, right? So this is what I'm hearing, you know, over and over type of thing. So I'll get into obviously ones that I have, and then if you've got any that you've heard semi-regularly or that keep coming up, we'll handle those too. So um, there's going to be a lot of, lot of writing because... I believe in the best way to learn is to actually write out scripts. So I'm not a fan when I do classes like this of just giving a handout and saying, here's all the answers. Uh, instead, I do the opposite. I make you write out the answers because I believe that that's the best way to learn. Um, so I will repeat myself over and over to make sure you have it. All right. Any questions before we get started? Cool. So let's dive right in. So I've got a list of probably eight to ten or so that I'm hearing most frequently and then We'll have some time at the end. This won't be more than an hour. We'll have some, you know, 15 or 20 minutes at the end to handle the ones that you're hearing also that maybe I haven't written down or that I totally forget about, forgot about. So you've probably heard this one before. If I list my home with you and buy my next home from you, will you cut your commission? All right. We hear that from time to time. Hey, if I'm willing to sign an agreement with you to sell my home, um, will you give me a break on the next deal? So I have a couple thoughts on that. Number one, I'm not a fan of doing that, and I will show you uh, how I handle that. If you absolutely had to do it, meaning it just made sense to get the contract signed, you were walking out of the house and they weren't willing to sign an agreement with you without doing that, all right? And this goes for any commission cutting. I'll kind of put this disclaimer out there. Um, you don't have to instantly go to you know, a 1% discount. You don't have to go to that 5% number or from 7 to 6 or 6 to 5, whatever it is. You can do a half a percent, right? A lot of times people just want to feel like they're getting a good deal. So don't think that it's just, okay, if they want a discount, we're going to have to go to 5 to make this work. No, if I absolutely have to do it, which by the way, for those of you that don't see our listing board every day, we maybe have 1 out of 60 or 1 out of 80 listings, maybe a couple a month that are below that 6% number. So my policy is always, no, we don't need to discount the commission because if we offer enough value, then, then it, it, it either A, won't come up, or B, if it does come up, is not necessarily something that you have to do because you have a great value proposition. So if you have to absolutely do it, okay, number one, you, you go from offering out 1% down, you know, a discount to just a half a percent. A half a percent will usually suffice. They'll feel good about that. Thanks for the discount. We appreciate it type of thing. The other thing I will say on that is you attach it to the second transaction. You never give it on the first transaction. Because what happens is somebody says, hey, if we buy a house from you, will you give me a discount? And if you end up doing that, which again, I'm not recommending that you do, and I'll give you some scripts on how I handle that. Um, if we have to do it, we're giving it on the second transaction. That way, there's incentive for them to continue working with you and buy a house for, with you on that second transaction. So how you do that essentially is you, of course, you would negotiate a deal just like normal, right? So you would come, come to some type of an agreement with, with a, a, a listing agent if you're representing them as a buyer. And then once you have an agreement and you know, you're a week away from closing or a couple weeks from closing, you would have them reduce the buyer's agent commission by a certain amount half a percent if we're using the, the sake of the argument here, and then it's a seller credit to the buyer, right? So it's, it essentially is the same net to the seller because the seller is reducing what they would pay you in the 3%. Let's say you go down to 2.5, and, and now they're crediting the, the buyer that half percent. 
So if you're gonna ha if you're gonna do it, which I don't recommend you do it, but if you're gonna do it, you always attach it to the second transaction. And of course, since most people are buying up, you know, they're selling their two hundred thousand dollar home and buying a four hundred thousand dollar home. Since most people are buying up, you always attach the first number to it. So it's not a half a percent credit on the house they're buying. It's a half percent on what they sell. It just gets credited once they buy. Makes sense. So if they're selling two hundred thousand, half percent of two hundred thousand is a thousand dollars. Basically, they're getting a thousand dollar credit on the house they buy. Now, of course, you know, depending on the conversation, you could always do the lower of the two amounts. But usually, the lower of the two is the house they're selling. So you're giving them an amount based on the house they're selling, but it's being credited on the house they're buying. Make sense? So if you're not going to do that, which, by the way, I would only recommend you do that if you're literally walking out of the house without a contract signed. And I'll tell you, you know, that's how passionate I am about that belief because, and it's proven, I mean, I can tell you, you, you look at our, our listing board every month, there's maybe just a few listings that are actually taken under 6%. So I know that uh, myself and our associates are adamant about that. The reality is, is that if you want to have a good response to that, I'll share with you my response before you instantly jump to, yep, you know, we have to do this in order to make the deal. So, first of all, before I get into the answers, I want to make sure everyone has a recap of the rules of handling objections. We've covered this before, so I just want to refresh your memory. Rule number one is always, always smile and nod your head, right? Rule number one is always smile and nod your head. Rule number two is you never argue when you're handling objections. Rule number three is you always restate the objection, so that way they, they, you're, you're essentially restating what they're asking you to do, so it shows that you're listening and you understand what they're saying. Uh, rule number four is you replace the word but and however with the word and. You replace the word but and however with the word and, so you don't say I understand where you're coming from but. Okay, when you say I understand where you're coming from but, you're basically saying you don't care where they're coming from. All right, so you're, you instead say I understand where you're coming from and, which rule number five is you use a statement of agreement. Always use a statement of agreement. A statement of agreement would be something like, I can appreciate your feeling on that. I understand what you're saying. I think I know what you mean. I can certainly appreciate where you're coming from on that. So that's in a statement of agreement. So we're always following the five rules. We're never arguing. We're always agreeing. We're always smiling. We're always nodding our head. We're sta statement of agreement. I can appreciate where you're coming from. We're removing the word button, however, and replacing it with the word and. So you'll hear that in a lot of my handlers while I go through here. So uh, the first one I'm going to give you on, on this particular one, um, it's, again, it, it, I've got usually two or three answers, by the way, for every objection, and I do that because depending on my rapport level and depending on the personality style of the prospect, I may handle it a different way. Fortunately, I'm going to give you a couple different ways to handle each one of these objections. So if I list my home with you and buy my next home, will you cut your commission? Will you give us a discount? You know, I can appreciate that you're looking to net the most out of this sale. I would want to net the most too, right? So I'm following the rules of the objection handler. And I have to be upfront with you and say that I can't do that. And for one very simple reason, can I share with you why? And I have to be upfront with you and let you know that I can't do that. May I share with you why? You see, as a, as a professional, just like you, my time has a certain value. And I only work with people like yourself that understand the value of service. And before you say anything, think about this. And again, I'll repeat this. If an agent is willing to cut their commission or their fee, just like that, how well do you think they'll be able to hold up to your home's value when it comes time to negotiate? So essentially, you're, you're having a negotiating, you know, a negotiating situation with them at your kitchen table right now. How strong can they possibly be when it comes to standing up to your sales price if already they're giving away their services or their value of their services? I want to demonstrate to you up front how tough I'm going to be for you. Therefore, we don't cut commission. We believe in what we do. And what I hear you saying is ultimately you want to net the most out of the sale of this transaction. Is that right? This is called a pivot. What I hear you saying is you want to net the most out of the sale of this transaction. Can I show you how we can do that? And then at that point, I would go into the Board of Realtor average list price to sales price ratio right now is like 95.5%. Okay, you'll have to figure out your average. I know my average, it's about 
So if I'm averaging sellers 98% and the average realtor is about 95.5%, you're actually netting two or three points more with me without any discounts at all. So if you're interested in increasing your net, this is how I recommend we do that. Make sense? And then I move on. See, I think the mistake a lot of agents make when it comes to handling objections is they want to continue sitting there and talking about it. Right? So I give, I give an answer, and then I say, makes sense, or fair enough, or understood. And they say, understood. And we move on. If I absolutely had to do it, which I tell our agents all the time, if you're literally walking out the house without a, without a contract sign, and it's the difference between getting a contract signed or not. If it's on this, if they're going to be buying another home and it's on the second transaction, you give it on the second transaction. You don't give a full point. You give a half a point. And remember, it gets credited on the second transaction, which gives them an incentive to continue to work with you. And how that's credited, after, you don't put it in the offer. Okay, Don't confuse the listing agent. You do a deal like normal. Couple weeks before closing, whatever, you go back to the listing agent and say, hey, I worked out a deal with my client. I'm giving them a portion of my commission. Would you please reduce the buyer's agent commission by $1,000 and offer a seller credit of $1,000 to the buyer? Okay, it's the same money out of pocket for the seller and that's how, that's how that credit takes place. So if I list my home with you and buy my next home from you, will you cut your commission? You know, I can appreciate that. You wanna net the most out of this sale. I totally understand. I would wanna net the most too if I was in your shoes. By the way, you'll notice I do that every single objection handler. I'm, it's, like, it's almost like I, I kind of picture in my head, like I'm wrapping my arm around them, like, hey, we're in this together. I get it. And I have to tell you that I can't cut my commission because as a professional like you, our time and our services have value. And how strong would it, how tough and how strong would it look if you're negotiating with me and I'm giving in that easily? My job is to stand up for the value of your home. And that's why we're averaging our sellers 98% of the asking price when the board average is 95 and a half. So if you want to net the most, you work with me. Number two, well, I have to keep my promise to the agent that I bought the home from. Okay, I, I want to work with you or I like what you have to say, but I really need to keep the promise to the agent that I bought the house from. I told them if I ever sold, I would work with them. Okay, we hear that from time to time. So I always start off with, hey, I can certainly appreciate your loyalty, and I definitely respect that. And let me ask you a question. Are you familiar with the difference between buyer's agents and seller's agents? And so essentially where I'm going to take this is down a path of helping them understand that there's a major difference between a seller's agent and a buyer's agent, not that one's better than the other. But in this particular scenario, when it comes to handling a listing, I'm educating them on the difference between the two, and I'll go, I'll go into even explaining what a buyer's agent does and their role of matching, matching a buyer up with a seller and a seller up with a buyer and, and finding buyers for properties. So I'll go through the process of a, of a buyer's agent and what their job is when I ask them, are you familiar with the difference between a buyer's agent and a seller's agent? And then I'll talk about what a seller's agent's job is to market the property, to, to write a great description, to get great photos, to negotiate on your behalf. And I always ask the question, how do you plan on getting top dollar and having a fast sale by specializing, by working with someone that specializes in working with buyers? Now, essentially what I'm doing there is, is I'm throwing out an assumption that their agent was a, is a buyer's agent. That may not be the case, but that's okay. They only know that agent as a buyer's agent. That's the agent that showed them the home and ultimately helped them buy the house. So when they say to me, well, I, I really think I need to work with the agent that found me the house, you know, that sold me the house, I promised them that I would do that, my response to that is, are you familiar with the difference between a buyer's agent and a seller's agent today? And I'll go through the explanation of the differences and ultimately help them to understand what I'm going to do as a seller's agent. Okay? So there's another way you can handle it as well that I have here on the script. And that is, I want to keep my promise to the agent who I bought the home from. Hey, that's great. I can appreciate your loyalty. And that is a quality that I respect in people. So I'm curious, and let me ask you this. Has there ever been a time when you decided to buy something and a friend said, Hey, no problem. When you need help, I can do it. And in the end, because you didn't check around, I'll repeat this. And in the end, because you didn't check around, you didn't really get what you wanted. Have you ever been there before? 
Well, I think you might find that this time is just like that time. And with that in mind, I'm sure you can see the importance of having me over to give you a second opinion. It's no different than the I have a friend in the business one. Right? We're creating a little, essentially we're creating a little bit of doubt. I prefer, you know, that's a second option. I prefer the difference between a seller's agent and a buyer's agent and helping them understand the difference and why it makes sense to at least give me a shot before they select a realtor. Number three, Sorry. I have seen this marketing plan from many agents. What makes yours different? I have seen this marketing plan from many different agents. What makes yours different? Okay, number one, when I hear that, it drives me nuts <laughs> uh, because they're all different, right? There's no way that what you're doing is what you're doing, right? They're all different, okay? But that is their way of basically saying, and don't get mad when I say this, that is their way of saying they don't see value in your plan of action. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have a good plan of action. What it generally means is you didn't do a good job of presenting it. So when they say to you something to the effect of, yeah, but that's what everyone's doing. That means either A, you don't have a strong plan of action, which I don't believe that's the case, or B, you didn't do a good enough job presenting it. So I have written down here, you know what, you're right. This is a total level, this is called a level shift. And by the way, at this point, if I really truly feel, because naturally the tendency is that you, to get into an argument, right? That's a human nature to argue with them on that. Well, what do you mean? Are you kidding me? You know how much we put in it, right? That's what you naturally, what you want to do. Don't do that. Instead, do what's called a level shift and actually take them away from the plan of action. And you'll see how I do this here. Because, and by the way, I've made the mistake. Really, they're going to do this? Oh, really? Everyone does this, right? You don't want to get into that. Remember the rules. We don't argue. We always agree. So I've seen this marketing plan from many different agents. What makes yours different? You know what? You're right. There are really only a certain number of things that any agent can do to sell a house. And I think the final decision is not based on what I do differently. You know what? You're right. There are only a few things that all of us can do to get a home sold. This is called a level shift. I'm taking them down a different path. And I think the final decision should not be based on what I do differently. There are, there are certainly a number of things that any agent can do to get a home sold. You're absolutely right about that. And I think the final decision is not based on what I do differently. I think the real issue is how you feel about the agent representing you. I think the real issue is how you feel about the agent representing you. So there's only a few things that we can do to get a home sold. I get it. You're right. And really what we should talk about, what we should be talking about is how you feel about the agent that's representing you. So my question is, what qualities are you looking for in your agent? So my question is, what qualities are you looking for in the agent that you hire? You know what? You're right. There's only a few things that we can do to get a home sold. Not going to argue with them. I'm going to take them down a different path. And I think the real decision is, is selecting an agent based on how you feel, making sure you feel comfortable with that agent. So my question is, what are the qualities that you're looking for in an agent? So I'm shifting from what I actually do differently and getting into a discussion around that to this. Now, I will tell you for myself personally, I will get into a little bit of a discussion. And I'll say, well, let me ask you a question. Have you had things presented to you that are different than this plan of action? Right? So we'll get into a little bit of a discussion, not in an argument, because I want to know, like, hey, if I'm missing something, I need to know this. If there's somebody, if somebody out there is doing something better, I need to know. So what have you seen that's different? And so we'll have a brief discussion about it, but if I feel like that's not getting me anywhere, I'll go to this. And I'll say, you know, ultimately, most sellers will end up choosing an agent that they feel good about, that they feel comfortable with. So forget the plan of action. What is it? What are the qualities that you're looking for in an agent? Another common one. Why is your price lower than the other agents that I've talked to? Why is your price lower than the other agents that I've spoken to? So, I will usually go into this kind of a dialogue. And... I'll always ask them, 
Interesting. So, so I'll confirm. Always agreeing, right? I'm always restating. Interesting. So you've had a few of us out. You've had some pricing presented to you. And what I hear you saying is that my number is lower than some of the other prices you heard. Is that what you're saying? Yep, that's right. Great. And my guess is that you've had other agents that have shown you the comps in the neighborhood and what's been listed and what's been sold. Is that right? Yep, that's absolutely right. Great. And I take, I already have my comps in front of them, right? They're already out on the table somewhere. So I just take them and I spread them out again. And I'll say, okay, tell me, what comparable sale in your neighborhood am I missing? Or have you seen that is not included in this set? Right? Let's, 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 fig let's figure this thing out because we got to get it right. It's important that we get the price right. So let's take another look. What comparables are not included that you've seen from other agents? And, of course, usually there isn't anything different. So what ends up happening is, and, and by the way, when, when I start to observe that they're realizing that there isn't anything different, they are the same comps, I'll usually go into this kind of a dialogue and I'll say, I think what's probably happening here, because listing inventory is so scarce, I think what's probably happening here, even though I know, okay, I'm not making any assumptions, I'm just saying I think, even though I know, I think what's probably happening here is agents, because listing inventory is scarce, are telling you a higher number to make you feel good about listing with them. I think what's happening here is agents will tell you a higher number so you feel better about listing with them, knowing full well that after two or three weeks, they'll be calling you to reduce the price. I think what's happening here, because listing inventory is scarce, is that agents are telling you a higher number to make you feel better about listing with them, knowing full well that in two to three weeks, if it doesn't work, they're going to be calling you to reduce the price. If it's okay with you, I would rather start this off with as an honest relationship and tell you the truth up front. Fair enough? If it's okay with you, I would rather start this off as an honest relationship and tell you the truth up front. Fair enough? It's my job to be upfront and honest with you about the price and not tell you what you want to hear just to get your listing. It's my job to be honest and upfront with you about the price and not tell you what you want to hear just to get your listing. And I'm afraid, and it's unfortunate, there's many agents out there that are doing that because listings are so scarce and they just want to get a listing. So we'll tell you a higher price to make you feel good about listing with them, only knowing full well that they're going to be calling you for two or three weeks to reduce it when it doesn't sell. By the way, I can do that too. But then I wouldn't be honest and upfront with you. And that wouldn't be a great way to start off a relationship, would it? Of course it wouldn't. So when they're saying other people are telling them that there's higher prices or that they can get a higher price, that's how I handle that one. All right, let's see. Here's one that we hear a lot right now. I want to find a home before I put mine on the market. I want to find a house before I put my home on the market. That's a real common one right now. Why? Because listing inventory is scarce. So I handle that one in a couple of ways. First things first, I want to see if they qualify to purchase a home. Uh, before selling, and, and probably one out of ten actually do. And, I'll, and, and I'll, I'll share with them the scenarios of, you know, how most buyers are, you know, have to buy homes. They, they have to sell first in order to go buy. That's common. Or do you fit, fit in that situation? Well, you know, we spoke to our lender, and we don't really have to, but we would like to, right? Most people don't want to have to own two homes or go shopping and buy something first. And so I'll, of course, always make them feel comfortable knowing that, hey, that's common. That's, that's how most people have to do it. You have to sell and you have to buy. If you're in a situation where you can buy first, that's great. Then you're not rushed. Let's do it that way. Knowing full well that, oh, by the way, we're going to be able to get your home on the market, get it sold, and probably get it closed before your first payment. Right? Because if you close on something on May 15th, their first payment isn't until when? 
July 1st, right? So literally there's gonna be maybe one overlap of a payment there. And I know that because their home shows well and they're gonna price it right, so I feel comfortable saying that. But what I usually like to do is I go to a timing analysis. And so I pull out a blank sheet of paper and I'll write, okay, I wanna make sure you understand the time that things are taking right now because in most cases, the consumers really honestly believe that if they, with the market moving so fast, if they put their home on the market tomorrow, that they're gonna, they're gonna be homeless in a month. And by the way, I, it's part of my script, I'll say, hey, the good news is of all the buyers and sellers that have worked with me, none of them have been homeless, so don't worry, we're gonna get you into something, you're not gonna be homeless. And I'll do a timing analysis, so that's just a matter of taking out a blank sheet of paper and saying, okay, today's date is what, the 27th, 26th, 27th? All right, so let's just pretend you, you sign paperwork with, with me today. Of course, I'm always assuming I'm getting the listing. So let's just pretend you're signing with me today. And I write a line and I put 627. Then I'll do another line and I'll say, listings are moving pretty fast right now. Let's pretend it'll sell in a couple weeks. Maybe it'll sell in a couple weeks. All right, so I'll draw a line, put a little dash, and put a couple weeks from now will be like July the 10th. All right, 710. And I'll put accept PA, right, accept the purchase agreement. Closings right now are taking about 45 days, so I'll go 45 days out from there, and that takes us to basically the end of August, right? If you're writing a PA right now, you're probably going to put a late August closing date. So let's just say 825 for the closing date, and then I'll draw another line, and I'll say I can usually negotiate 30 days in the home after closing, 925. So essentially what that means is you have from now until the end of August to shop for a house. In the busiest time of the year, don't you think you'll find something in the middle of summer when you have at least a month or month and a half? Now, what usually happens is say, well, I didn't realize the timing or that it, that it worked out that we had that much time to shop, right? So, you know, we'll have a little discussion about that. And, of course, I might even go into if I can get them more than 30 days in the home after closing, you know, 60 days. Now you've got a full two and a half months to shop. So it's not like you're out and then you're out on the street and then you got to find something in a week. You have a month and a half to find a house at the busiest time of the year, summer. So I find that, quite honestly, the timing analysis takes care of that objection because then they get it, right? So I'm going into the timing analysis every time when that one comes up. I also have another way. Of course, you can do a contingent offer, which, you know, depending on... The scenario, I'm not a big fan of contingent on sale, but you could take them out and start showing them homes and make a contingent on sale offer. You know, they're probably not going to get the hottest house on the market, right? They're probably going to have to settle for something, to, you know, because it's off, if the seller's getting so many offers, it's one of the lower quality offers. But that is obviously an option as well. All right. Number six or five or whatever number we're on. You don't handle homes in our price range. You don't handle homes in our price range. So I've got one that I'm that I've got written out that I'm going to share with you, and then I'm going to give you another another line of thought on that. Okay. I call this one the honest response. You don't handle homes in our price range. You know we we need a luxury agent. Hey, you're right. I don't sell a lot of homes in your price range, and that's exactly why I'm here tonight. I usually sell homes in the two dollars to $300,000 range, for example, and what I find is after I sell my clients homes, a great many of them move up to your price range, right? They sell their $250,000 Cant Colonial and move up to a $500,000 Northville one. Therefore, it only makes sense that the next logical step is for me to start to sell in your price range as well. So in other words, you're, I use that, I call that the honest response. You're right, I don't sell homes in your price range. I sell homes in the price range of sellers who are half the price, and oh, by the way, they move up and end up buying homes like yours, so you actually have an advantage of working with me. Does that make sense? I already have a relationship with many of the buyers that are gonna be interested in your price range because I'm working with them as sellers. Sometimes I'll go, so I'll use that approach, or sometimes I'll go into this approach. And I'll say, you know, um, a top luxury agent, because we're in Metro Detroit, our average sales price is 200000 or 250000 And although there are luxury sales, a top, most top luxury agents, you know, they cap out at like 8 or 10 or 12 sales a year. 
So they're, they're doing eight or 10, 12 sales a year on the luxury end. Well, if you figure out at a million dollar price point, let's say they do 10 of them, which is pretty good, that's $10 million in volume. 3% of $10 million in volume is a $300,000 in revenue. That's before paying the broker, that's before paying Uncle Sam, that's for, before paying marketing. There really isn't a lot of money left over to put extra time, energy, and marketing into your home. And that's why working with an agent that sells homes from 100,000 to 2 million is actually a benefit to you because I have all the resources of the two, three, four hundred thousand dollar sales and the commissions that come in off of them that I can devote to your million or million two or million and a half property. So I call that the luxury agent example of most luxury agents don't have the resources because they're only selling six or eight homes a year. Not only that, but because they're only selling six or eight homes a year, they're not handling as many issues as I'm handling, right? Whether you're selling 30 homes, 50 homes, 100 homes, whatever the number is, that's 30 scenarios that I handle a year. It's 30 inspection issues, 30 appraisal issues, 30 financing issues. So I actually have more experience with everything going on in the market because I'm handling things more, more frequently. You can also use the doctor analogy. If you went in for a surgery, would you rather have the doctor that performs that surgery 30 times a year or the doctor that performs it six times a year? Most luxury agents are only handling six to 10 surgeries. I'm handling 30 or 50 or 100 or whatever your number is. <coughs> never under any circumstances when you get the luxury agent objection, never under any circumstances tell them that it's the same thing as selling a $200,000 house. That is a fast way to lose a client. Right? I've heard agents say, well, and by the way, the reality is there's not much different. <laughs> we know this, right? But the perception is that there is. So if that's their perception, okay, we're not disagreeing with it. We're not fighting them on that. So I'm not, I'm not coming out and saying, well, really, there's not much difference between selling a $1 million home and a $200,000 house. And certainly there's different things we can do, right? You don't see too many $200,000 homes in our magazine, right? There's definitely some different things you can do. But for the most part, it's not that much different. But don't come out and say that because you will offend them. <clears throat> Next I have another objection. I need to net this amount in order to sell. I need to net this amount in order to sell. I need to net this amount in order to make this sale happen. I like to use the handler that I call put yourself in the shoes of the buyer. I can certainly appreciate that you need to net a certain amount out of the sale. Uh, I'm interested in helping you net the most, so I'm in favor of you netting more. <laughs> when you net more, we met. When we when you net more, we net more. And I'm curious when you go to shop for a house and you find the home of your dreams. It fits everything that you're looking for. And we get into negotiations with the seller, and you ask me, "What is the home worth? What are homes selling for in the neighborhood, and so forth?" So we get into a discussion with the listing agent about what we could negotiate for the property. The seller's agent comes back to me and says, I'm sorry, Jeff, I know that the market says the home's worth 400,000, but my seller has to net 450. Are you gonna pay the 450 because the seller needs to net that amount? Or are you going to go back to, well, the market says it's only worth 400? Well, in that scenario, yes, I would, you know, I'm not going to pay what the seller, okay, so then how do you expect a buyer to want to agree to the price that is a number that you need to net out of the sale? So I use the put yourself in the shoes of the buyer. When you go to purchase a property, are you going to be, will you be okay if the buy, if this listing agent comes back and says, we know the market says it's worth four and a quarter, but my seller wants 450. They have to have 450 in order to buy their next home. Are you going to say, hey, no problem? No, you're going to say, well, the market says it's worth four and a quarter. So put yourself in the shoes of the buyer. Oh, let's see. I need to order this next. Oh, another one that kind of falls under that same um, discussion. We need to net a certain amount. Or, or uh, this is a lot of times when you're negotiating an offer with the seller. You're ten thousand dollars apart, let's say, and let's say they're downsizing. Okay, remember, 
a lot of people downsize for physical reasons, right? They want to get rid of the steps or they want a smaller yard. And they'll, they'll tell you those things, but they'll also, they, what they won't always tell you is it's also for financial reasons. For whatever reason, people don't want to talk about that or they're embarrassed to say that, but a lot of times it's for financial reasons, right? They have a smaller income or they're retired and limited income, that type of thing. So I do this one definitely when we're discussing price with the seller, but also when we're negotiating. And usually what I'll ask them, and this works well when someone's downsizing, is if you don't mind me asking, what are the reasons that you're making this move? Now I know they're going to say the stuff. Well, we want a smaller yard, or you know, we, we don't we don't need a basement anymore, or we want a first floor master, or whatever it is. Whatever they say, I'm always asking: Are there any financial advantages to downsize for you? Have you taken that into consideration of the financial advantages to downsize? And by the way, the answer is always: Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They won't tell you. They've but by the way, most of them already have a spreadsheet showing exactly they know what they're going to end up, you know, per month saving. So let's just pretend they're going from a $400,000 home to a $200,000 home and they're making a downsize and they're probably saving in that price range 1,000 a month, right? So if the number is 1,000 a month going from a $400,000 house to a $200,000 house, over the course of 12 months they're actually saving $12,000. So I'll say I'm sure you've calculated the math of what you're going to save by making this down by downsizing, and my guess is just knowing that you're looking in the $200,000 range and we've got your $400,000 listing, it's probably somewhere around $1,000 a month. And usually they'll say, "Oh yeah, we calculated it. You know, it's $1,200 or it's $900 or it's $1,500 or whatever it is." Great. So by making this move in one year, you'll sell, save $12,000. Or of the course of five years, $60,000 will be saved by making this move. Is it really worth it over $10,000 right now? Right, You're going to have this back in 10 months. So let's price it right or let's take this offer. So when it comes to that kind of a situation, I'm going to what they're saving per month. I'm calculating out 12 months and then I'm timesing it by five. In five years, you're going to save $60,000. So I get it, it's $10,000 less than you want to take right now, but you're going to make that back up in 10 months. You're going to have it all back by doing this now. So I use that specifically in the downsizing or right sizing uh, situation financially that helps. I calculated it out and I show them what they're saving. <coughs> Next objection. <coughs> Well, if I have to sell it at that price, then I'll just sell it myself. Okay, we've heard that. If I have to sell it at that price, then I'll just sell it myself. I want everyone to write in your margin or wherever you're taking notes, collateral analytics for sale by owner study. It's called collateral analytics for sale by owner study. It is the latest and greatest study out on for sale by owners. It is a neutral party. It is not a bunch of realtors that got together. It's not NAR. It's, it was a university that did this study, nationwide study, on for sale by owners. Collateral analytics study. Well, if I have to sell at that price, I'll sell myself. Mr. or Mrs. or Mr. or Mrs. whatever seller, are you familiar with the latest for sale by owner study? Well, what's that? Well, I would encourage you to look up collateral analytics for sale by owner study because if you do so, what you'll find is that for sale by owners right now are averaging nine ninety five and a half percent of their sales price versus what realtors are selling homes for. And this is all backed up in this study. Some markets it's worse. Not five and a half percent lower is I'm sorry, it's ninety-four and a half percent. They're averaging ninety-four and a half percent the realtor assisted transactions. So my question is, how do you plan on saving money by selling it yourself, knowing that? Because you could hire me for 6% and essentially I take care of the other 5.5%. You're paying me a half a percent to handle the entire transaction from start to finish. And stepping out of the role play for a second, I would encourage you all to get a copy of that report because that report has like 40 pages of details. There's all kinds of stuff in there. But if you are bored and have the time, read it. But if you don't have the time, just know that it's it's in there somewhere. 95, or 94 and a half, 5.5% less 
on the list price to the sales price versus the realtor assisted transactions. So you don't necessarily net more by selling it on your own. And by the way, most for sale by owners end up paying a 3% brokerage fee anyways. So now, now you are netting less out of the sale of your home because you're selling it for less, but now you're paying 3% on top of that. How do you plan on netting more? <clears throat> Here's one that we hear from time to time. We don't want to price it to sell fast. We don't want to list it at that price and sell it in a weekend. That is giving it away. Anytime a home sells fast, it's giving it away. So, I like to use what I call the leverage conversation. And I start off by doing this. Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I totally get it. The perception you have, which a lot of people have, is that if it sells fast, we must have priced it too low. Is that what I hear you saying? Absolutely. Totally understand. And let me ask you a question. When you become a buyer and you start to shop for homes. Now, of course, if you know they're going to be a buyer with you, you can go this route. If you don't know this, then you can just say, let me ask you a question. Are you familiar with the number one question that buyers ask their realtors today? Are you familiar with the number one question that buyers ask their realtors today when shopping for homes? Now, of course, if they're going to be a buyer, I'll just tell them. What do you think the number one question you're going to ask me when we start shopping for homes is going to be? And sometimes they say, what's it worth, whatever. Sometimes they'll get it right. And the right answer is, how long has it been on the market? The number one question buyers ask when, when showing homes and selecting one that they like is, how long has it been on the market? And I'll say, why do you think they ask that? Why do you think you'll want to know that? Why is that important even? Well, it's important because the perception is the longer the home is on the market, the less it's actually worth. So, again, jumping from the start, because I know a lot of you are writing really fast. What do you think the number one question is that buyers ask realtors when shopping for homes? Or what do you think the number one question is that you're going to ask me when we go out shopping for houses? And they're going to give you whatever answer. Sometimes they get it right. Great when they get it right. How long has this, this one been on the market? And why do you think buyers ask that? Well, because then that tells me whether it's overpriced or not, or whatever their answer is, no matter what they say, I'll say because the perception is the longer a home's been on the market, the lower we can make an offer. That's the reality. That's why buyers ask it. The longer a home has been on the market, the lower the offer we can make. So since we know buyers ask that, and since we know you'll probably ask me that when we take you out shopping, that means simply on your listing, the higher the days on market, the less we'll get for your home, which is why it's extremely important that we price it right, right out of the gate. Because it's my job to be upfront and honest with you and tell you the truth, not what you want to hear. And the reality is, is when we go shopping for houses, you're going to ask me that same darn question, and you're going to ask the question because the perception is, is that if it's been on the market for a while, we can offer less. The, the other side of that is, if something's new to the market, guess what buyers and buyer's agents believe and say and think? Oh, we're going to have to give them asking price. This house is going to get into a bidding war. This house is worth a lot. This, this is a great value. So the reverse of that is, is less days on the market, higher value. So that's why it's important we get it right, right out of the gate. Because it's my job to get you into a multiple offer situation. Now, I can't guarantee it. And I always put this disclaimer out there. We don't know the value until we put it on the market and see how buyers respond, right? So I'm always saying that even when I get it priced right. The reality, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, is we don't know the true value until we get it on the market and see how buyers respond. And they're going to respond in one of a couple ways. The reality is, is that we won't actually know the true value until we get it on the market and see how they respond. And they're going to respond in one of a couple ways. Number one, they're going to respond with a lot of showings, a lot of interest, and hopefully multiple offers. And that means we priced it right. Now, the reason why it's important that you have this discussion at the time of the listing table is because if that happens and you didn't pre-sell pre them or warn them on that happening, they think you underpriced it. 
So it's very important, even when you get it priced right, that you're having this discussion of, Mr. Mrs. Seller, looking forward to going to work for you. You got a signed agreement, okay? You got a price picked. We're getting, re you know, I'm getting ready to leave the house. I'll say, you know, Mr. Mrs. Seller, it's my job to make sure you understand that we won't actually know the true value of your home until we put it on the market and see how buyers and buyers agents respond. And one of a few things could happen. Number one, we get a lot of showings and we get into multiple offer situation, and that means we priced it right. That's the key. Because what do they believe? That you underpriced it if that happens. So because I'm telling them this at the listing table, they'll never come back and say, you didn't price it high enough, we got you know, offers the first day. No, 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 remember we talked? And by the way, it still happens because they conveniently forget the conversation. I say, no, 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 we talked about this. This is, what I'm, this is a good thing. One of a few things happens, right? A lot of showings, a lot of interest, we price it right. Or we have a lot of showings and no interest, and that means we're in the ballpark. We just may have to make some adjustments. Or we have a decent amount of interest, and that, but no offers. That means we're in the ballpark, and we just might have to make some adjustments. And I always say the adjustments could be condition or they could be price. We'll talk about it at that time. The adjustments could be condition or price. We'll talk about it at that time. So I'm kind of preparing them or pre-selling them on the idea that it's really only one or two things. It's going to either be improving the way it shows or reducing the price. So we could get some good interest but no offers. And if we get some interest and no offers, that means we're in the ballpark. We just might have to make a few adjustments, and usually those adjustments are either on the price or on the condition of the home. Or, worst case scenario, and this happens sometimes, I hate when it happens, but it happens, we put it out there and we don't get a lot of interest at all. And that tells us that the home is, is pretty overpriced. Or we put it out there, we don't get a lot of interest at all. That tells us that, that the home is, sometimes I say significantly overpriced. Right? It could be 5% overpriced, 7%, 10%, depending on the price range. So if I have that conversation at the listing table, then they're not calling me after a week or two and saying, what's going on? We're not getting any activity. Now, they'll still do that but you refer back to the conversation. Well, unfortunately, I think what's happening is the number three option we talked about at the table, and that is that we started way too high. And we need to get this corrected before your listing becomes stale. And then you go back to the days on market conversation. You don't want buyers seeing that your home's been on the market for 32 days. The perception is, is that it's not worth as what it's listed at if that's the case. Same thing goes to, we can always come down in price later. It goes back to the leverage. You have the most leverage as a seller in the beginning. We aren't quite ready yet. We need to finish up a couple projects around the house. We aren't quite ready yet. We need to finish up a couple projects around the house. This one comes up from time to time. We need to finish up on a few projects around the house. I always say this, that is perfect. My timing is impeccable. Well, what do you mean? Well, before you do anything to your house, I need to come out and take a look at it and offer you some suggestions of things that you should and should not do. You see, many sellers take it upon themselves to remodel bathrooms and finish basements and replace flooring without talking to realtors, and then they end up losing money on those improvements. So this timing is perfect. I'm glad we're on the phone talking right now. I caught you at a good time. I'm going to be in your neighborhood later today. Why don't I swing by and I can offer you some suggestions on things you can do to help it show better and probably save you a few thousand bucks. Well, we want, we're not right, quite ready yet. We need to finish a couple projects around the house before we put it on the market. This is perfect. My timing is impeccable. We need to set up a time for me to come over so I can point out things you should and should not do so you don't end up costing yourself thousands of dollars later. Because what I find is a lot of sellers go through the hassle of remodeling bathrooms and finishing basements and replacing flooring, and they didn't even need to do that. They're out several thousand dollars. So we don't need to sign, you know, we don't need to get your home on the market right now. That's fine. I'll come out. I'll offer you some suggestions. Now, by the way, while I'm there, I'm getting a listing contract signed. I'm just post-dating it, right? We identify some things that need to be done, carpet, paint, declutter, the basics, and, you know, it's going to take them a week or it's going to take them 10 days or two weeks or whatever it is. And I'm post-dating. I'm getting a contract post-dated. 
Okay, you always get the contract post dated because there's so much that can happen from the time you meet with them to the time they finally list. So I'm just getting a post dated agreement and even if they say, well, we don't know how long this is gonna take, this could take us a month. I tell you what, we'll, we'll post date it for two weeks. I'll call you in two weeks. If you're not ready yet, I'll move the date back another week or two. Right, so I'm at least getting a start date on paper. By the way, I like to do that because it gives them a target. It gives them something to shoot for. So we're not quite ready yet. We need to finish up a couple projects around the house before we put it on the market. This is perfect. Let me come out and share with you what you can do to help it show better, save you some money. Now, by the way, there are some properties that need a lot of work in order to help them show better, especially on the higher end. So there may be some serious recommendations. There may be recommendations of taking down wallpaper and come, having a crew come in and paint the whole house or paint the exterior or replace all the carpet, right? But wouldn't you want to know from an expert who's in the field and does this every day before you go do, make the decision to do things yourself? So another one, of course, um, that we're hearing that I heard yesterday. Someone brought up in Great Lakes, and we'll get to the point where you can give me some too. Um, well, if I sell now and go buy, you know, I have a three and a half percent interest rate on the house I'm selling. You know, interest rates are four and a half percent now, and selling prices are at a premium. So I'm not sure I want to make this move because it's going to cost me a lot. You know, I've got this great rate, and it's a seller's market, so I'm going to pay a premium for the house I buy. So somebody brought that up yesterday, and, and essentially how I handled that was, and I'm, this isn't a role play, this is just me sharing with you my thoughts on this. Most people don't, their number one reason for moving is not for financial reasons. It's a reason, okay? It might be number two on the list. It may be number five on the list, but it's hardly ever number one, right? Unless it's an investor who, you know, puts this amount in and they expect this return. Most families, upsizing, downsizing, growing older, divorcing, whatever it is, are not moving for a financial reason. It's usually number two, number three, number four on the list. They're moving for some sort of emotional motivation, something that they'll gain on the other end. So what I told the gentleman that brought this objection up yesterday I said, go back to why they're moving. So how do you do that? You just remove the fact, you remove the objection that he brought up. Okay, totally understand, you're right. Interest rates are higher, it's a seller's market, you're gonna pay a premium for a house. I get it. Now, of course, the good news is you're gonna get a premium for yours, everything's relative. And oh, by the way, if you wait, prices go down, you're gonna get less for your house, but you're gonna get a better deal, I understand. Everything's relative. Besides money, besides the interest rate, Besides what you're going to get for your house, besides for what you're going to pay for the next house, <coughs> why are you making this move or why are you even considering moving? And, you know, let's just use the example of they want to downsize. I don't accept the answer they want to downsize even. I want to dig deeper on that. Okay, the criteria questions. Right, how is downsizing important to you? Ultimately, what will downsizing do for you? Right, I'm asking some deeper questions to find out why they really are truly making the move. And most cases, when I dig a little bit deeper, I'll find out that it has nothing to do with interest rates or money at all. It's because of A, B, and C. And oh, by the way, money is important, and money is something worth talking about, but it's never the number one reason in most cases. So if someone were to bring that up to me, then that's exactly how I would handle it. Going back to money aside, Let's say money is no object right now. Money aside, why are you making this move? Why are you even considering it? So that one was brought up yesterday in the Great Lakes class, and I wanted to share that. So there you have it. I've covered every single one that I'm hearing on a regular basis right now from start to finish. Give me one or two that I didn't cover. Again, if it's a unique situation you know, save it, because if it's probably a one-time thing that's never going to come up again. But if it's definitely something you've heard a couple times or you're anticipating hearing, let's talk about it. They don't want to list their home because the house that they want to move into, they feel it's overpriced. You know, because they're shopping out there, whether they're downsizing or yep. move for whatever reason, they're like, wow, these houses are a lot more expensive than I thought. Yep. But So I don't want to list right now even though I can get tapped out of my house. Yep, so it goes back to exactly how I handled the last one. Okay, gotcha. okay. It's the, 
Understood, and I'll role play with you. So um, I can certainly appreciate that. You're right, we are in a seller's market. The good news is you're gonna get more for your house than you probably would get in the last 10 years, and guess what? So is the seller of that home. And I'm curious, besides for the financial reason, why are you making or even considering making a move? And so I'm digging Let's deeper. Dig deeper yep. I know what <clears throat> yeah, because in most cases, then I can use that and ask questions off of that to say, you know what, even if it is 10% more or 5% more or $10,000, whatever the number is, then I can say, is it worth it for 10000 bucks to stay here when you can accomplish A, B, C, and D? In this particular case, his motivation was just downsizing. This house was just too much home for him. Yeah. He wanted a smaller home in the same area. Yeah, so that's a, <laughs> that's a great one to go to the downsizing. How much are you saving per month? Right. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Good one. Yes. Um, I had a seller ask me, the other agent I interviewed said that they have a buyer for this house right now. Do you have a buyer for this house right now? That's a great one. I love handling that one. The age, other agent I interviewed said they have a buyer right now. Do you have a buyer right now? My answer to that question is, you know what? Absolutely, I could have a buyer right now, but can I tell you why that would actually be a disservice to you? You see, Kim, it would be a disservice to you because if I had a buyer in my pocket right now that would be willing to buy your home, then that means I wouldn't be exposing it to the hundreds, if not thousands, of other buyers who may be interested. And if I did that, I would actually be doing you a disservice because we could miss out on a buyer who may be willing to pay more and get into a bidding, bidding offer situation, which ultimately gives you leverage as a seller to maybe to get someone to pay over price value. So, by the way, it's the same thing I tell our agents all the time. Stop accepting the first offer that comes in. It's a disservice to the client. Now, of course, if the, offer, if the house has been on the market for a while, that's a different story. But instead, see what you can do to use that new listing as leverage to try to get them into a multiple offer situation. So when someone says that to me, it's the same thing that goes for the for sale by owner, by the way. It's actually a good, you could handle the for sale by owner objection the same way. Well, well I've got a buyer. For sale by owner says, I've already sold it. You know, I've got, I've got buyers that are interested. Gosh, could you, you have buyers that are interested as a for sale by owner? Could you imagine how many buyers I could have for you? And how much money we might be losing out on because you, your neighbor came over and said they have someone that's interested? So with a for sale by owner, I'll even say, you know what? I'll exclude them. Give me their name. I'll exclude them right now. Let's expose your property and see what we can get for it. I bet it's more than that buyer's willing to pay. So that, that's how I would handle that one. That's a good one because I've heard that one before too. Yeah, let's just exclude them. Fine, no problem. And by the way, 99 times out of 100, no. they're not coming back. No. no. It's happened to me, honestly, in 15 years, twice. Okay? Twice. Every now and then, it's like, oh, that shucks. <laughs> it actually, they actually came through and bought. But even still, even if they do come through, is it really in their best interest to accept an offer from a neighbor without us fully exposing their property and seeing what they could get for it? Now, of course, if they say, well, they're, they're willing to give me $10,000 more than I want and this amount over appraisal and now, you know, no commission at all, right? That's a little bit tougher to argue with, but that's exactly how I'd handle that, that one. What else are you hearing? Yes. These buyers, uh, we're going to try it on our own now. And if we don't, we already have an agent lined up. Ah, uh, okay. We're going to, Expire says, we're going to try it on our own right now. And if it doesn't sell, we've actually already got an agent lined up. Perfect. So are you interviewing agents for the job of selling your home? No, not right now. No, because you already have someone lined up. By the way, yeah. that's a rhetorical question. I did that on purpose. Yeah. Well, wouldn't it make sense that if you're going to be trying to sell your home on your own that you at least interview a few agents and hear what the best of, of the best are doing to sell homes? That way you can take those techniques and apply them yourself without even hiring an agent. Wouldn't that be a win-win? So what I'm actually doing is I'm convinced, trying to convince him to interview agents and to take my plan of action and try to do everything you can on here to get your home sold. And oh, by the way, if it doesn't work, you at least will have known that you've met with the best of the best before you decide to hire an agent. Because why would you want to get tied up in a multi-month agreement with an agent if you haven't interviewed multiple agents and had a chance to see what else is out there? Fair enough. So I'm still convincing them to at least meet with me so they can hear what I'm doing differently you're going to sell it yourself? i got a great plan of action. Let's see, you know, take a few things off of my plan of action, right, that you can maybe do to yourself to get your home sold. Now, the reality is, is that they're not going to be able to duplicate most of the stuff on there. But, you know, they may get crafty and come up with a cool Zillow ad or something because of it. 
So I'm going to take that approach and, and how it's a win-win for them because I'm going to share with them what we're doing to sell homes and they can take that information and maybe duplicate it and use it for their own benefit. Good one. What else are we hearing right now? Well, I think we're hearing, at least I'm hearing a lot of uh, the agents, they're always saying, um, oh, well, I have three different agents who said they would discount their, their commission, mm -hmm. especially if I'm buying another house. I'm always hearing that. Yeah, yeah. So it goes back to, of course, the discount commission, which we okay. talked about. Um, and I understand it. Inventory is tough. So an agent will say basically anything they can to get a listing right now, and it's unfortunate because it makes our industry look bad. The reality is, is you want to net the most out of the sale of the home, don't you? Yes. Yeah, okay. The difference between me and everyone else is I'm averaging 98% of the asking price. Everyone else is at 95.5%. So what are they, are they giving you a 4% discount? In most cases, the answer is no. It's probably a half percent or 1%. So even by paying 6%, you're actually still netting more with me. Do you feel I can sell your home? Yes. Great. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So yeah, no, that, that, you got to be strong on that one. Absolutely. What else? Are you By the way, I'm coming back with that since I learned from the best. So. There we go. <laughs> what else? Another what yes. If they, what if they ask, um, a seller ask me if I list their home and then I find my own buyer where I'm getting the full 6%, mm -hmm. then will I discount? Yeah, that's a great one. So I'm actually okay with that because, number one, it doesn't usually happen. So if they say, well, well, if, if you mean the seller brings the buyer, right? Yeah, so if the seller brings the buyer, I have no problem giving a point or even two points off. Because the reality is is that I would probably put a time frame on there, right? You know, you have you know, you have fourteen days to find your own buyers or thirty days to find your own buyers because at that point you put a lot more into the listing. But if they if they find their own buyer and they don't have an agent, which means you're getting both sides of the transaction, then I have no problem giving them a point or two off for that. And I have no problem writing that in up front. I mean, I will, I will tell most sellers, if I represent both sides of the, today when I go out on appointments, I am offering that. If I represent both sides of the transaction, we are giving you a point off, right? We're not, if we're not sharing it with, with another agency, I have no problem going to 5%. And sometimes that alone will help overcome the commission objection because they at least feel like they got something, right? So, yeah, no problem. If, if I represent both sides of the transaction, I'll, I'll do it for 5%, no problem. That's very common. What else are we hearing right now from sellers? Either at the presentation, over the phone, negotiating, anything at all that we're hearing from sellers. Yeah, let's hear it, Devante. Um, pretty much a phone objection. Uh, we want to sell, but we don't want to list. We want to sell, but we don't want to list. We still want to sell, but we don't want to list the house. Okay, so I, I go. what I hear when they say that is that they don't want to sell bad enough, right? Because my thought process goes back to why are, why are you selling? Right? And usually what I find is they're not that motivated to sell. Because if someone's motivated to sell, they're going to list the property. Or at least, I'll, they'll, I'll, I'll take it this way. I'll say, you know what, that's fine. Are you going to try to sell it on your own? I can take it? Yes. Great. Most for sale, we know most for sale by owners have at least some sort of timeline of how long they plan on trying it on their own before hiring an agent. So my question is, what is your timeline for selling it on your own before you hire an agent? Um... <clears throat> we we'll probably sell it pretty quick, so we don't really know. You'll probably sell it pretty quick? Mm -hmm. Great. So you think in a week or two? Uh, probably 30 days. 30 days. So if you can't sell it in 30 days, because you're, I'm sure you'll sell it, right? It sounds like you sound pretty confident you'll sell it. This is the role play with the for sale by owner. If you can't sell it in 30 days, then you'd consider hiring an agent. Correct. Great. Are you familiar with the techniques that I'm using to sell homes? Um, you guys just thrown an MLS, right? Well, that's exactly why we need to get together. I'm going to be in your neighborhood later today around 3, 4 o'clock. Would you mind if I stop by and take a look at your house? Uh, I guess that's fine. And oh, by the way, while I'm there, I'm going to share with you exactly what we're doing from start to finish to get home sold. Fair enough? Sounds good. So that way, if you can't sell it on your own, you'll at least know what we're doing. Okay. Right. All right. So that one, I'm just trying to get in front of them, right? And remember, we're never setting up for sale by owner appointment with the understanding that we're going to bring buyers by, right? That we want to see their house to bring buyers by. I'm going to stop by, take a look at your home, and share with you exactly what I'm doing to sell homes, right? So that way they know going into it what I'm going to do. You know, so they're not throwing me out when I when I lied and said, oh, here, by the way, I'm here to look for a buyer. And here, hey, here's what we're doing to sell homes, right? Good one. What else? Anything else we're hearing right now? we got time for one more. Any other objections that you're hearing often or 
stopping yeah. you or, or getting in your way? Now, let's hear it. I was driving with Devin Wood, uh, ended up talking to the wife. She said, we'll call you, you know, if, you know, when we're ready or something like that. And, you know, and then they, they got six months, they had this redemption period. I was texting her. I didn't call her. I didn't text her. She don't want to answer. But she yeah. texted me and said, we'll talk to you when we're ready. So I sent her some mail information just to try to stay high on that trail. I'm staying on the floor there when I leave there. Yep. And talk to them. Well, uh, usually that, that's a smokescreen objection. So whenever I hear someone say, you know, we need to think about it or, or we'll let you know when we're ready, there's usually a deeper thing happening there. So I'll say, I'll usually say, okay, if you don't mind me asking, what would cause you to be ready? I just ask. If you don't mind me asking, what would cause you to be ready now? And what will happen is it will uncover the objection. Well, if we could get our price, if you discount your commission. Well, I can't be ready now because i got another agent I need to interview. So if you don't mind me asking, what would cause you to be ready right now? If you don't mind me asking, what would cause you to set an appointment with me right now? All right, a lot of times what will happen is you'll uncover the real objection. So whenever they say, I want to think about it, I want to sleep on it, I want to think it over, that's a smoke screen. In most cases, that's not really true. There's something deeper. Yeah, they want to think it over, they want to talk about it, but there's something they want to talk about, right? It's price, it's commission, it's their neighbor, they promised an interview, whatever it is. So thank you for asking that. All right. Well, this completes handling today's seller's objections. Thanks for coming, guys. We'll see you again next time. All right. Yep, you got it.